everyone. Hi, hi. Hello, everybody. Hello and welcome to you all. So uh, allow me to introduce you all to our guest speakers here today, Ivan and Katerina, who are joining us here from Memgraph. And they are here to introduce us to graph data structures. If you remember from our past workshops, we said that data structures are very central to both computer science and data science. And in particular, working with large data structures requires special algorithms and special tools. Fortunately, today here we, we have Ivan and Katerina who are here to uh, introduce us both to these types of data structures and a special tool or a set of tools for dealing with such data structures. So welcome to you all and uh, Ivan, I will give you the floor. Okay, thank you, Danny. Let's do the presentation. And uh, like Danny already said in his introduction, uh, today we're going to talk about graphs, graph data structures. The talk of the session is graph-based stream processing, but we're going to cover a lot of the basics and the actual implementation that makes graph-based stream processing uh, available to us. So um, you can see a little um, spoiler of the data set that we're going to use. And let's dive right in. So this is yeah, my colleague. So, <laughs> hi, I'm Katarina. First, a little bit about me. So welcome all. Glad to have you here. Uh, so uh, I'm born at the Croatian coast in the little town of Šibenik. Probably no one heard of it, but if someone has heard of it, just let me know, I would be really glad. Uh, so I did my master's in mathematics and computer science at the Faculty of Science in Zagreb. And I work as a DevRel uh, at Memgraph. Um, I love to travel, cook and eat tasty food, yeah. So this is not a joke. Uh, my whole Instagram profile is just food. So if you, are, if you love food, feel free to follow me and that's it, yeah. Uh, and that's about me just. You can ask me later, whatever you want. <laughs> okay. uh, so this is me, a little less photogenic than my uh, colleague. <laughs> I was also born and raised in Croatia, currently living in Zagreb, the capital city. Uh, similar background, uh, I got my master's in computer science, also in Zagreb from the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing, uh, currently pursuing a PhD. I also work at Memgraph as a developer relations engineer. If you're not familiar with the role, that's okay. We kind of create demo applications, code snippets, uh, try to spread awareness about the whole field of graph technologies, the graph data analysis, data analytics. Um, and I just uh, copied this from uh, Katarina. I also love to travel, cook, and I definitely watch Netflix too much. I have an account for Amazon Prime, Netflix, and HBO at the same time because I can't live without them. <laughs> so this is more or less it. About yeah, I'm this. seeing... Uh... I'm seeing the comments, just have to comment on the comments. Thank you, Slovenian neighbor, for <laughs> knowing where Šibenik is. And uh, also, yeah, Slavic brothers, yes. <laughs> so uh, let me start with uh, the intro to graphs. So a little bit about the graph data model. Not sure if many of you are familiar with the graph data model. So I'm going to tell you a bit about that. Uh, so first, what are graphs? So a uh, graph is a structure that uh, has nodes and relationships. And maybe you have heard of vertices and edges. This is just a different naming convention that is usually used in mathematics, but either is good. So we are using here nodes and relationships. So just that you know that we are going to stick, try to stick with that. Uh, so nodes are structures that uh, represent entities and relationships are connecting those entities. We also have properties, and those are some kind of key value pairs on uh, nodes or relationships. So on the right, you can see the example of some simple graph. It is called labeled property graph because of the label on nodes. So here we have a label person on this node, and we have a node with uh, multiple labels. So here are labels city and location. So. Um, we have these kind of uh, nodes and we have relationships connecting them and each relationship has a type. So 
for example, person can be married to another person and type of this relationship is married to. And this relationship has property wedding date. So if you are looking in your database, grab database, um, all people that are married on some date, you will be looking for these properties on these relationships. You also can have different kind of relationships. So for example, lives in, and as you can see, you have a set of properties on each node that are defining defining that node a bit further. So name, date of birth, something similar to that, whatever is descriptive for you. So this is just a simple example of uh, some graph data model. This can be a lot more complicated, but I think this is a good example to notice what is not, what is relationship and what are properties. So, um, let me just switch. Uh, okay. Uh, so you probably have heard of relational databases and probably have used it. Um, and graph databases are maybe not that, um, I don't know, not many people know about them, uh, but I'm getting, like, I think they are becoming more and more popular, but I would like to explain the main differences between them. So on the right, we have a relational database uh, so relational database, you have a different kind of tables. So tables have names, those tables have, um, they have um, primary keys, foreign keys, and you can join that tables. Uh, and in, by joining them, you are connecting them. So the data is not connected in the start at the beginning, but in graph databases, all data is connected. So you have these relationships and that makes it easier to query. So it's not always, better to have a graph database, it depends on the use case. And the use, good use case would be if you have uh, many to many uh, relationships. So for example, if you have friend of a friend that is a friend of a friend and something complicated like that, then in tables, joining tables, something like that thing becomes much more complicated. But in graph databases, this is actually pretty simple because, because you have a rela relationship friends with, and that's it. I mean, you, you just have a relationship between two types of nodes. Um, another difference is that in the relational databases, you have some certain schema that you have to follow, while in the graph databases, they are schemeless and you don't have to follow that schema. You can define different set of properties on the same node, on the same label, labeled node, and uh, that is good because they are prone to change. So these are some kind of main differences, but I'm going to tell you a bit more, a bit further. Um, so this is maybe also another big difference. Uh, so we have a Cypher query language. This is a language uh, with the help of which we communicate with the graph database. It is, I mean, there are many different uh, uh, query languages for the graph databases, but this one is the most widely adopted, uh, most used, and uh, it contains clauses. So in SQL, you are maybe familiar with uh, select, where, join, something like that. So this is similar to that, just in Cypher, it's match, delete, set, return. Then you also have functions. Um, those are probably some kind of mathematical functions or something for strings, something similar to that. And you can also write custom procedures. Uh, they can be written in Python, C, C++, and Rust. This is for... I'm talking about memgraphs, so maybe in some other graph databases you can do different kind of stuffs, but this is most popular. So as I told you, uh, SQL uh, and Cypher query language, they are very, I mean, they are similar, but they are different because depending on the use case, uh, Cypher query language that is graph databases can be proven as much simpler than the relational databases. Uh, here, you can see on the left, we have some query. So if you are not familiar with the Cypher, let, let me just guide you through this because I think it's pretty intuitive. So uh, we are doing some kind of recommendation query and here we are matching, we are trying to find some customer. This customer has its ID customer one, let's say. So this is just a simple example. And this customer bought some product and we want to see, uh, some other customer that also bought the same product that is defining some kind of similarity between those two customers and check out which other products that other customer bought. And then we are recommending that product. I mean, here, where not 
uh, is saying that we don't want to recommend you a product that you already bought. So we are recommending only product which you didn't bought. And we are giving you those products as the recommendation. On the other hand, in the SQL, I mean, it's okay, but it's uh, oh, no problem, <laughs> but it's really uh, long. I mean, uh, this is so long because uh, this kind of example recommendation engine is a really good use case of grab databases. Ivan will tell you more about that, but uh, this is a good example of how uh, query can be uh, simpler and shorter in Cypher query language. I think uh, okay. Ivan is next. So uh, we are going to show you a quick demo about how to connect to a graph database, how to create these knots and relationships, connect them, analyze them, run some more advanced uh, algorithms with them. But before that, let's cover uh, the graph model that we're going to use in this example. So what are we going to create? This is more or less it. So later on uh, in this talk, we're going to show you a demo application that we created to use graph analytics uh, in real life. And uh, we use this data set. We scraped a lot of tweets uh, from Twitter. And the model is very simple. So there are a lot of users. Each user has a unique username. Like on Twitter, if you already use it, you're probably familiar with it. And uh, all of the users are connected with one type of relationship, and that's retweeted. This means that one user has retweeted another user. And that's more or less it. Uh, one of the simplest data models uh, that we can come up with. And what we're going to do is perform graph analytics on it. So what does graph analytics mean? Uh, it's about generating insights that are hidden in the network. So we are analyzing the relationships between entities to find out how they interact with each other. So which uh, nodes are connected more to each other? What kind of structures do they form? Uh, what does the local neighborhood of a node look like? What does the more general neighborhood of the node look like? And then we can uh, generate these insights, get valuable information from it. So for example, if we know that one node is in the same uh, community as another node, they probably share a lot of preferences together if you're talking about users. Um, Kata? Um, yeah, so uh, here comes MemGraph. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about this since we are going to use it in the demo. So MemGraph is a platform for graph computation on streaming data powered by an in-memory graph database. This is a pretty big sentence and maybe seems a bit confusing at first, but actually it's not that complicated. So uh, it is a platform for graph computation on streaming data. What does this means? We are actually storing data inside MemGraph and we are doing different kinds of graph analytics calculations on that data, but this data is coming in real time. So this is a streaming data. And in the background, we have a MemGraph DB, which is actually an in-memory graph database. Um, uh, uh, besides that, we are going to use MemGraph as a graph database and graph analytics platform, and we are going to use GQL Alchemy. Uh, so GQL Alchemy is a fully open source uh, project. So if someone is keen to open source contributing, feel free to check it out. Uh, it is a Python library and it's an object graph mapper, uh, which represents a link between graph database and Python objects. So maybe you are familiar with uh, object relational mapper uh, for something like SQL Alchemy. This would be like SQL Alchemy for graph databases. So it includes OGM capabilities, query builder on disk storage and graph schema validation but you are going to see how we are actually using GQL Alchemy in our workshop. So and then, yep. <laughs> let's go um, to a little demo. So we created a Jupyter Notebook. If you're not familiar with it, it's literally code. Uh, that's kind of uh, split with comments, with actual text. So you can read about it before you start something. So this is a code block. And once I click run, it will be executed. And that's more or less it. This is Python code. So whenever I go over one of these blocks and click run, uh, the command will execute and already be visible here. A lot of data scientists use Jupyter notebooks because they are simple, they are intuitive, visual, and it's kind of the easiest way to show something. 
so about the prerequisites, what we need is, of course, Jupyter, because we want to run this notebook uh, that's already been set up. Docker, because we're going to be running MemGraph inside of Docker. Uh, it's a Linux application, and I'm currently using Windows. So by creating a Docker container, a Linux-based container, I can start MemGraph inside of it. If you're not familiar with Docker, that's absolutely OK. So uh, GQL Alchemy, as Kat already mentioned, and the Pandas data science library, just to show you the data set. We are not actually going to use it for anything smarter than that. Um, so about uh, installing MemGraph with Docker, it's this command. If you have Docker installed, this means you only have to run this in your terminal. So yeah, uh, he is actually starting. You can notice MemGraph platform. So Ivan, you can maybe tell a bit more. Yeah, of course. So um, aside from MemGraph, uh, another thing will another application will be started. That's the MemGraph Lab uh, visualization tool. So you can run queries. Uh, cipher queries and then get the results back here in this application. Um, it's run on localhost 3000, so you can open it up in your browser. Um, so localhost 3000, and yeah. So you have the same app in your browser. Um, now let's go back to the notebook. So MemGraph is now up and running, and we need to connect to it from our Jupyter notebook. So how are we going to do that? First, we're going to import uh, MemGraph from the GKL Alchemy library. OK, that's done. Now what we're going to do is connect to it. This is a typical uh, connection command, which you use with most databases. This could be literally uh, MySQL, Postgres, and so on, other grab databases like Neo4j. Uh, this address means that it's running on my local computer, and this is the port where it's listening. And the connection has been established because we got no error back. Uh, what we're going to do now is make sure that the database is empty. We are going to drop it. So delete every node and every relationship that might be in it. OK. And now, to make sure that it happened, we are going to execute our first Cypher command. So as you can see here, uh, we use the memgraph object, and we call the execute and fetch method. So um what the query does is match n this finds all of the nodes in the relationships and adds them to the variable n what we do is we return count of n the count function literally uh returns the number the of uh, objects in a variable so the number of nodes in the variable n and we're going to return it as number of nodes once we execute this, yeah, it's the same. So the number of nodes in the database is zero, which makes sense. If I open the lab application, um, you can see here in the dashboard that the number actually is zero. Now let's remedy that and actually create something. Yeah, and also if someone has, I'm noticing that you are writing stuff inside the chat. If someone has a question, feel free to tune in and ask. It's not a problem. You yeah, can interrupt us whenever you want. Absolutely. Uh, I see the little icon above the chat that there are messages in it, but I can't uh, open it because I'm sharing the screen. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Danny, Danny is helping us out. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, of course, Ron, you can interrupt whenever you want. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, Ivan showed you how to connect with the database, and we uh, noticed that everything is working now. So we are connected with the database. We can execute different kinds of queries. And now I'm going to show you how we are going to define the graph schema. So as Ivan showed you, we have some user. This user retweeted another user. So what we are actually going to do, we are going to create Python classes, and these classes will represent that uh, schema. So here we have a class uh, user. This class is uh, inheriting from the uh, node class. Uh, and this means that it will have label user. If you want to have a different kind of labor, you can also define that. If you want to have multiple labels, that is also possible. You just give it a set of different kind of labels. Here we have a property username. This is a type of string. And this field part is actually from the Pydentic. It's uh, giving us a possibility to define different kinds of constraints inside our database. 
So here we have set index true. This means that our um, username property uh, will be indexed. And in this way, we can query the database much faster. Um, unique true means that uh, there couldn't be two, two users with the same username inside the database. So if you have some, I will show you that actually later on. And uh, we have DB mem graph. Uh, then for the relationship, uh, so we have a relationship called retweeted. So it, of course, inherits from the relationship class. And here we have a type retweeted because in the Cypher query language, a naming convention is that you, are, you, that you should use uppercase uh, letters for the type of the relationships. It's just prettier like that. It's better to use it like that to di differentiate uh, the type of the relationships and labels of the nodes. So here we have type retweeted, just telling the database, okay, be in uppercase. Uh, we are passing here because uh, our relationship does not have any properties. So we are not giving it anything. So we need to start this in order to create these classes. And now let's check how we can, oops, sorry. Uh, we can check how we can actually create some users. So here, we are creating uh, actually Ivan and me, I think. Yeah, Ivan G Despot and Super Katarina are Twitter handles. And we are creating them by uh, creating an instance of the user class and give it in a property username and then just uh, dot save memgraph. So we are calling this method to save it to memgraph and printing it out. Let me start this uh, cell. Yeah, so actually this is, uh, uh, like someone mentioned in the chat, you have the code output here printed out. And this is all, this was already printed out uh, because we started it earlier. But once I click uh, run, this will be rerun. So yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm going to show you why we had those constraints. So this constraint was that there cannot be two users with the same name and this username was already created super katarina and now i'm going to start this and let me just explain a bit here we have a cypher query create uh, we are giving label user this means i'm creating a node because it's in this uh, uh, curly break not curly this in parentheses it's not sure which one are which one but yeah uh, we are creating a node uh, with label user and it has property username and we want to check whether this is pos possible. And we get the error because we had a uniqueness constraint on the username. So that's great. Um, let me just check. I mean, Ivan, it's maybe better if you check because of I'm course. controlling your screen. Uh, let's check if we have, okay, two nodes, great. Uh, so just do match and user return. And so I want to see if, uh, yeah, you don't have to specify that the label is user because we know we created only two labels. But when you want, when you have lots of data, you are filtering by giving it a label. So if you have lots of different kind of labels, uh, then it's better to specify that you are looking for a user. Here, it's only two users, so that's just fine. Uh, just uh, yeah. one thing that you might have forgotten to mention: mm -hmm. um, if you look oh, at this yeah. object here uh, that was returned, so that was printed out. You see an ID uh, equals yeah. zero and ID equals one. Why is that happening? Because these are internal IDs. Once you save a node to memgraph um, and probably uh, most other graph databases, they get an internal ID uh, that only the graph database uses. So once I go into the lab application and I check what properties the node has, it says only username. But uh, yeah, internally, there is an ID that is created and it's unique for each node. So that's what you're seeing. Yeah, it's just an ID that is being generated for the each new node or relationship. Uh, thank you, Ivan. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, so next, we need to create the relationship. Uh, it's actually pretty similar to the creating of the um, uh, of the uh, nodes. So we are creating an instance of the retweeted class, but here we are giving it a start node ID and end node ID. And this is why it's good that Ivan mentioned the internal IDs. So actually, this underscore ID is the internal ID of the node. So we are giving it the start node and node. Here is uh, not sure who was user one, Ivan was user one. So Ivan retweeted Katarina. This is actually telling that, us that. And we are saving it to memgraph. And let's check 
this out. Okay, so this created a relationship. You can notice that it has also internal ID zero, but this is not a problem because this is a relationship. So it's not the same as nodes. This is not actually the same internal ID. Uh, and it's connecting uh, these, uh, it's connecting the nodes with uh, ID zero and one. These are internal IDs that were above. So Ivan, you can show, uh, show oh, us. In lab. Yeah, in lab maybe. Um, so match N. And then just a second, uh, the Zoom oh. application is creating a toolbar that's making it oh, impossible okay. for me to oh, write I know, queries. I know. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, just add the relationship between them. Okay, so M are like relationship and let's return all of them. So what I have written here is a Cypher query that says, find a node N, um, it has a relationship, to another node M. If we had a hundred nodes and a lot of relationships, it would return all of them. But thankfully we only have two nodes and one relationship. So this shouldn't be a problem. Yep. Oh yeah, you have physics enabled. That's why this is <laughs> this is a bit uh, bouncy. <laughs> disable physics. Yeah, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> disable physics. Okay. okay. It right. doesn't have any properties on it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's that's actually it. That's how you can simply create a node and relationship using GQL Alchemy. Now Ivan will show you maybe a bit more a uh, bit more data. Okay. Uh, while these examples are fun and sometimes useful, it kind of doesn't make sense to create all of the nodes and relationships in this manual way. We are gonna load them from a file, like most often in production settings. And we have actually a CSV file, scrape tweets. When we scraped Twitter for users and who retweeted whom, it was in December, there are around a, a thousand entries in it. Uh, what we need to do first is a copy the CSV file from my local file system to the Docker container where Memgraph is running because these are uh, two separate environments. But um, as you can see, the command isn't that complicated i only need to find the id of the container so let me show you quickly uh first with docker ps okay this is the so container. he is listing all the running docker containers with the docker ps uh, command yeah and let's see if i have my csv file here yeah scrape tweets.csv it's ready in this directory so now docker copy uh this file to the container with the ID. Ooh, no, 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 no. Copy the wrong thing. Okay, so uh, copy it to the container with this ID. Okay. And it will be named like this. And it's in the root of the container. So copying successful. Now we can continue. Um, we're going to use the pandas data science library just to read this CSV file and to display what it looks like. So uh, we have two columns. One is source username, the other is target username. So this user retweeted this user. And that's it. All of the entries in the CSV file look like this. Pretty simple. And as it says right here, now we can execute a cipher command load CSV. This is a cipher clause that enables us to go through a CSV file and perform a query in every row. So what do these queries do? Um, the, okay, so for the first part is of course load CSV from, I defined where the CSV file is located and send the root of the container and with header, because there is a header in the CSV file, it says source username and target username. And I say, once we go over every row, uh, each row will be saved to the variable row. And now we do merge. What's merge? It's uh, very similar to the create clause, except that it tries to find uh, if a node already exists with these properties. So for example, if I try to create a user with a username, Ivan, and there is one already in the database, the merge query won't create it because it says, ah, it's already there. Uh, the create query would create another one with the same username. Of course, if uh, you don't have a constraint. Yeah. yeah. 
if it's allowed to create another user with the same username. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kata. And um, so this is the first merge. We create the first user with the source username. Then we create the second user with the target username. And then we connect them. So we say user one is connected with a relationship with the type retweeted to user two. And this is going to go over every row in the CSV file. So once I hit run and execute it. Now let's check Memory of Lab to see if we actually have a few more nodes and relationships than we had before. OK, so uh, 1,870 nodes and 1,670 edges. Um, we can run a query to get part of the graph. So. Let's say again, we find all the relationships we want to return them, but we're going to use limit 100 because we don't want to wait for a long time. Uh, just a second, Ivan, uh, we have a little question in of course. the uh, chat. So yeah, <laughs> this is a good question. What are edges? This was what I was talking about earlier. Edges are relationships. So yeah. We are mixing it, everyone is mixing it. There are different kinds of naming conventions. So whenever we say or write edge, it's actually a relationship. And probably because people are using it in the code, it's easier to write edge and node because those are, those are short, shorter. But actually nodes and relationship versus vertices and edges. But yeah, edges are relationships. And also another question is, if one source retweeted several targets, it would show them all in order of source. Uh, yeah, so there is actually no, how would I say, there is no order you would have. Yeah, yeah, the gray lines are edges. Yeah, that's right. So you have a user that retweeted a couple of other users. So you would have this circle, this node, and it retweeted. So like this, yeah, what he is showing, this central user retweeted lots of users, or it's being retweeted. You can notice the arrow where it's pointing. This is the direction of the relationship. So you will have one user that is connected to the other users, which he retweeted. So for yeah, example, not here, as a list. Yeah. Yeah. This user retweeted two other ones. And that's more or less it. Yeah. So let's continue here. Um, querying the database and retrieving results. So here I'm gonna execute a very similar cipher query. So uh, match find nodes with the label user then return them but order them by their username alphabetically but descending and limit it to 10. and these are the alphabetically ordered users that we retrieved from the database so it says here it's a user the internal id is uh, 1818 the labels it has is only user. We could have uh, created more labels, but no need in this example. And the only property is username. Um, here, we are going to check the type of the user. And as you can see, it says the type of the returned object is user. This is the class that we defined before, so here. Uh, GQL Alchemy knows once you retrieve an object from the grape database, uh, what the class in Python is that it maps to. So it already translates it. So you can uh, work with it with like with any other Python object instead of having to parse it yourself and uh, finding out what kind of properties it has. Uh, it, everything is being done in the background. So uh... Uh, let me just uh, give a little pause here for another question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is yay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay, is there a concept of weighted edges? And uh, okay, first you can have, actually you can have a weight edge if you give it the property with property would be, would be called weight and that's it so you can have a weight you can have whatever property you want but someone asks ask is that to indicate how many times one source retweeted the same target like the more retweets the higher the target you can actually you don't have to have weight property on the relationship for that you can just count the number of relationships maybe we can show some example like uh, some certain yeah you can pick here this user in the some of these users yeah this one yeah. Uh, copy its username 
let's match him okay so sure. okay property username okay and, and this one let's okay it's uh -huh. and then count r or am i wrong r sorry <laughs> And you can you can remove n n it's not necessary we just want to see how many users oh, this no, user no. retweeted without yeah. limit okay this would be that weight you are talking about i think if i if i understood you well yeah so this user retweeted 25 other users is that what i mean i mean you can give it a property but actually here it's not necessary since you can count the relationships i would say i mean but that's your choice of the uh graph model uh we can also do that i mean we can now write uh if you want to add weights to the relationships so we have the relationship r we can just say set r yeah, you, yeah of course yeah That's wait right. equals i don't count. know two can you do count r Okay, of course, I can also do count R. Yeah, yeah. But that's more or less it. I can uh, set any property I want uh, on the relationship. So if you want weight, you can have weight, but you can have, of course, more complex properties as well. So yeah. uh, I'm not going to execute the query because it's going to mess up the data set and uh, <laughs> we are running graph algorithms on it. Um, another thing I have to show you is a query builder so um, this is a pretty standard technique that we use also uh, when working with other databases we don't want to write cipher queries all the time because it gets a bit harder we are now in python we don't want to write another language inside of it so these constructs uh, aren't that popular uh, so we write python code instead um, this is the same query what we do is first match so we tell uh, the graph database, we need to find something. Then we say we need to find nodes. The labels of the nodes is user, and we're going to save it in the variable u. Return everything, order by username descending, limit it to only 10 results, and execute. And it's going to do the same thing as this query. It's only written in Python. So run. And the results are exactly the same. So this is a uh, very useful if you want to avoid uh, using these long strings of cipher queries. Uh, Python code gets uh, a lot easier to manage later on when it becomes complex. And there are a lot of other functionalities behind that are happening when you use these constructs. Uh, we can check if uh, you defined a correct label, if you maybe use the variable that you haven't used somewhere else. Uh, a lot of checks can happen in the background, whereas when you do this, this string uh, gets sent to the graph database and then is executed there. So there is no checking on the Python side of the program. It has to go all the way to the database and be executed to know if uh, something will go wrong. So for example, if it shows an error, it needs to be executed and then the error needs to come back to the Python program. Okay, so now we're gonna run our first graph algorithm and it's gonna be the page rank algorithm. If you're not familiar with it, Google implemented it and it's the one powering Google searches. It assigns uh, importance, influence to nodes in a network. So for example, when we are talking about the World Wide Web, we have a lot of websites and uh, they are linking to each other. And the one that has the most links going towards it probably is very important. It has a lot of influence. Um, so let's run the PageRank algorithm on our graph. So we call the PageRank algorithm and say get. Get us the PageRank results. Uh, we yield uh, a node and its rank. So um, for example, for Katarina, it will say Katarina. And the rank could be, I don't know, 0 0.001. Oh, thank You'll you, Ivana. <laughs> uh, so then we set a new property to the node. We say, OK, so take this node, create the property rank, and assign the page rank value to it. So we can save it to the database. We, we didn't just calculate it. We also saved it to the node. And then we return everything. We order it again by rank descending because we want the first one to be the node with the highest page rank. And again, we're going to limit it to 10. So 
Now we executed the query, we returned the results, and we're just gonna go through the results in a for loop and print them out. And as you can see, the user World Music Award, a pretty popular Twitter account, has the highest page rank value. Uh, don't get uh, discouraged by the small numbers. Uh, the values are normalized. So even though it looks kind of small, it's much, much larger than any of the other ones in the network. So now that we ran this query uh, from GQL Alchemy, um, let's run another one in MemGraph Lab so we can visualize the results and actually see something. Uh, again, the same query, we found all the nodes and all the relationships between them, I returned all of them and limited to 100. Okay, this is, these are the results in the form of rows. These are the results in the form of a graph. And now let's apply styling to the graph. Um, this is graph style script. Um, very similar to CSS, if you ever used it in web development. Um, and if I paste it here and click apply, nice. And I'm actually going to label physics now. So can you guess which user this was? World Music Award. Uh, it's quite larger than any other node because it has the biggest importance in the network. So here we have another user. Uh, maybe these are not all the users that retweeted this one because we limited our query to 100 results. If I click on expand, it will show uh, other nodes if there were any that we didn't return. So this is more or less it about this um, simple example of how to work uh, from a Python script from a Jupyter notebook. And we can continue to cover a bit of the graph analytics use cases. So they are used in a lot of companies nowadays. As I already mentioned, Google uses the PageRank algorithm to measure the importance of web pages. Facebook utilizes community detection to find uh, clusters of uh, highly connected users in their network, and then they can maybe recommend other users uh, who they think they will like to be friends with. Um, Amazon uses collaborative filtering to create product recommendations in real time. So based on your preferences and the preferences of other users who have similar preferences to yourself, Amazon is gonna recommend you products that it thinks that you're likely to buy. Uh, Pinterest and Uber Eats are very good examples of applied graph machine learning. So graphs can also be used to uh, empower machine learning models and get even more features and information from them. Um, this is a pretty simple social network where a lot of users are friends with each other. Uh, we can run uh, community detection algorithms to count, uh, kind of cluster them together to find uh, logical communities. Uh, we can use graph machine learning to create link predictions. So uh, which user is likely to be connected to another user? Uh, what's the chance of that happening at some point? Uh, this is a pretty cool image. It's a black background, and the only thing that's visualized are connections of Facebook users. Uh, this is a very, very large graph with over 2 billion uh, relationships, and kind of makes sense that the Amazon, uh, Sahara, and larger parts of China and Russia are grayed out because they don't really use Facebook that much or they're uninhabited. Um, recommendation engines, as we already mentioned, utilize graphs a lot because it's uh, much simpler to create queries uh, in such networks than using uh, SQL, SQL. Uh, as you already saw before, uh, the SQL queries can get pretty complex, pretty long because you have a lot of tables that you need to join in order to create the relationships, while the relationships in the graph are already present and they are saved on uh, each node. Then uh, supply chain management is again, another very uh, good use case. You can use it to find weak links in the network uh, where it's uh, most likely to break. When are we gonna have uh, problems? Uh, what supplier is the most important one? Uh, where, do have, where do we have bottlenecks in the network? Uh, decipher queries are much simpler than uh, using the relational model. Uh, fraud detection is probably the most 
utilized use case of graph analytics. A lot of banks, insurance companies are using it nowadays. Again, because of the relationships, for example, if you have a user um, here represented with a credit card, you can uh, find all of the relationships it has to uh, POS devices, uh, transactions, uh, other credit card users, just by looking at it, but just by returning all the relationships it has. It's literally one line of cipher code. And you can again use uh, advanced graph algorithms like PageRank and like community detection to maybe find rings of fraudsters that are working together. Um, it becomes much easier to get these relationships and these insights from such a network than it will be from tables. Uh, yeah, and uh, we are going to talk about a bit graph stream processing. So all we did so far wasn't actually with streaming data, wasn't with uh, real-time data, but we are going to show you that it really works with this real-time data. So we are going to do graph analytics with the streaming data. Uh, so what this actually means uh, is we are doing graph stream processing. So we have some kind of input data that is a real-time data source and it is uh, going into some kind of stream processing engine. In this case, MemGraph is actually doing the job of stream processing engine. And in this engine, you are doing different kinds of analytics, uh, graph analytics, and actually uh, the best algorithms to use are the dynamic algorithms, because if you have data that is coming in real time, you can have uh, lots of data, and then uh, it would be too slow to run uh, algorithms, uh, graph algorithms on your whole um, data. So, for example, you can have like millions and millions of nodes, and then you are trying to run page rank algorithm, and you wait a lot. Uh, but if you are, if you have dynamic page rank algorithm, it actually um, approximates uh, rank values and knows the whole state of the uh, database uh, rank values. Uh, uh, so it's actually calculating only on the incoming in the incoming uh, nodes. Uh, so uh, once that is calculated, uh, then the results are being sent uh, to the output. So this output can be some kind of analytics. Uh, you can do furthermore, uh, or, or it could be some kind of output stream. And we are going to show you in our example uh, with uh, some kind of uh, uh, backend server where we are sending our data that is going to be processed uh, for them more. So what uh, stream processing actually is, it is a type of big data architecture in which data is analyzed in real time. It is used whenever you need to extract additional information from your data as it's being consumed. So this is what I was talking about. This is, uh, this is with dynamic algorithms. The processing happens asynchronously. So the data source and the stream processing work independently without waiting for its response from one another. Okay, so let me just show you the architecture of the demo application uh, that we created. Uh, so the source is the same Twitter network I already showed you, the CSV file that we imported, so a lot of tweets that we scraped in December, and what they all have in common is the tweets mentioned the hashtag Christmas, so we wanted to have a holidays network, which we can analyze to find uh, the most Christmassy person in it, and uh, what we are doing right now is we are uh, mocking the data source, the streaming data source. Uh, we go through the CSV file, and each second we send one row to Kafka. Uh, Kafka is our message broker. Uh, it's a service that has uh, streams of data in it. So uh, messages are being sent to Kafka. And then you can connect from other applications uh, to it, uh, from other sources, and listen to these messages. Um, that's more or less it if you're not familiar with the concept. So a lot of messages are being sent every second to Kafka. And then MemGraph is directly connected to it and ingesting these messages. So every time a user retweets another user, this message gets sent to Kafka. And then MemGraph reads it from Kafka and creates the nodes and relationships that you already saw. So it connects users with a, a relationship retweeted. And aside from that, uh, the data is again being sent from MemGraph to Kafka. What kind of data? The data uh, that's being uh, analyzed. So we ran the page rank algorithm. We found the rank of the node. 
we send it again to Kafka, to another stream of data. Uh, we run the community detection algorithm in Memgraph. We send the results back to Kafka. Why do we do that? Because a lot of other applications and services can then connect to that stream and read the results. In this case, there's only one. We created a Python Flask server, a simple web application that's reading from this output stream. It's reading the results. And what it's going to do, it's going to send them to the front end client that was created with React, and it's going to visualize it. That's more or less it. So we used Memgraph to find the page rank value of each node. Uh, we used community detection to assign each node to a community. Uh, we sent the data to Kafka. We read the data from our Flask server, and then we sent it to the front end client to visualize it. Maybe it looks a bit complicated, but it was probably the simplest setup that we can come up with. Uh, we're going to demonstrate it now so you can see what I'm talking about. It's going to take me a minute to power everything up because we are using uh, Docker Compose. So let me find it right terminal. Uh, ah, here. OK. OK, I was muted and I was talking. Uh, <laughs> uh, while you are powering everything up, I can maybe re reply to the chat. Uh, so, yeah, can we check if a graph is a complete graph, determine if it's our regular graph and so on. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether we have a, whether we have a module for checking the completeness and regularity, but we have some kind of graph analyzer. I'm going to send you the documentation. I know we can check, is it bipartite? Is it planar? Is it bi-connected? But for this kind of check, I'm not sure whether there is some uh, good algorithm and whether we implemented it, but actually you can create your, your own module for checking this. But I don't think, I mean, this graph shouldn't be too large, but to check whether it's, for example, R regular, I think you need to check uh, the degree of all uh, vertices and this vertice has to be, this degree has to be R, if I remember well, not sure our regular graphs that was a long time ago. But yeah, um, you should then check all the count the relationships from that node and check whether that number is R. And you can do that in Python with uh, query modules and Mage is our library for query modules. So I send you the, yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, degree of all nodes should be R, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure whether we, um, Ivan maybe knows if we have this um, query module. Uh, but actually, I, I, I think there is a function in the Network X Python library, uh, which oh, we also integrated okay. into Memgraph. So you can use Maybe, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll send you this link too if you want. But yeah, yeah, that's Annex. Yeah, okay. uh, we integrated with uh, Network X, so probably then you can use it. <laughs> I haven't used it so far, so. Okay, so what happened now is I started the data stream, I started Kafka, I started a server. We are now just waiting for the front end client to uh, build and power up the React application. It takes a few seconds. And in the background, data is already being sent to Memgraph and being analyzed. So if I open localhost 3000, that's where the app is running. Uh, we shall see a few nodes coming in in a few seconds, hopefully. Okay, so it's happening. Uh, what is happening, actually? Uh, nodes are being streamed uh, to Kafka. So I can sh show you. So this is every message that's being sent at the moment. So a lot of users, uh, you can see here the user Susie to let, it has this rank uh, and this is being visualized here. The radius of the node, again, corresponds to its page rank value. So World Music Avoid has the largest rank in the network. That's why it's the largest uh, node. And down here, you can see community detection. Uh, the nodes are changing color based on the community they belong to. So it's a propagation algorithm. It recalculates the values of uh, communities once a new node is added to the network. And then it tries to uh, determine the right community to put it in. So this is more or less it about the application. A lot of stuff happening in the background, but this is the end result. 
And thank you, Katarina, for creating this React application. <laughs> yeah, if someone is more interested into this front end, uh, let me know. Yeah, <laughs> this was a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's actually connected uh, via WebSocket to the Python server, and the Python server is connected to the Kafka topic. There are a lot of connections uh, happening uh, right now. Okay, so okay. that's more or less it about the demo. Uh, yeah, but we need to tell you what's under the hood, right? <laughs> uh, this this is more or less it. We already covered it. The data set is a Christmas data set. Each tweet has the hashtag Christmas. And what we were calculating was the page rank value of each node that was added to the database. And we ran a community detection algorithm that assigned a cluster, a community to each node. And this was being done in real time. Each time a new node gets added to the network, a dynamic page rank uh algorithm is started it only calculates the page rank value for this one and sees if any other neighboring nodes need to readjust their value and the same is true for the community detection algorithm it assigns a community to the node that was created and checks if any other nodes in its neighborhoods also need to be assigned a new community because they have a new arrival maybe something changed in the network that's more or less it about dynamic algorithms. I mean, the math behind them is a bit complicated. The implementation is also complicated, but thankfully you have, don't have to think about it. You just need to run them. I can jump in to make a quick comment. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, we do have an upcoming course in April about the fundamentals of programming and pure mathematics a subset of which is discrete mathematics and a subset of which is graphs. So do check out the main website if you want. Uh, do check out the, the syllabus. Um, I, I can talk about that towards the end if anyone is curious. Uh, also, that real-time visualization that you showed me is incredible. Yeah. I am literally, literally right now I have uh, on Google Cloud, uh, on the compute engine, using uh, a Redis, and I'm going to come to that in a moment, to, uh, I'm actually doing page rank right now. Right now, it's just for web pages later on. I want to do this for, for books, because uh. page rank is one form of link analysis. Now, the one I'm actually curious about, or the one I'm interested in doing is for books, right? So in the previous, in the previous workshops, uh, I talked about how it's very difficult to come across good quality content on the web. So if you want to learn something, Googling it is not going to really get you very far. The best source of learning is books, but which books? Which books are great quality? Well, one way to determine if a book is worth the while is to see how many books are referring to that particular textbook, yeah, yeah. right? So I, this, I cannot wait to get my hands on your platform, right? Because after I'm done uh, crawling uh, pages of different books, my most important part is two, two things, the indices of the book, mm -hmm. uh, where the terms are defined, and the bibliography. Yep. And what I want to be able to do is visualize how many books are citing this one book, because then that will tell us, you know, uh, which because it's it's very difficult to choose the right book. Uh, uh, actually, there you... is a there is a very similar use case uh, which I heard people are doing on our faculties. So they are researching the scientific community, and they mm -hmm. are researching the scientific papers and the citations on these papers, and they are determining like the significance of this paper and so on. I mean, it's a, it's a similar thing because they are doing the research about this uh, bibliography and connecting dots uh, who who citated someone else or something like that so yeah it's actually a good graph use case oh yeah, absolutely i would be very much interested in that right especially yeah. if you're a data scientist uh, you will know about the latest learning uh, learning uh, latest uh, machine learning technique or data science technique from academic papers so yeah. what I'm envisioning is this graph getting bigger and bigger, and I'm <laughs> able to determine the the, the root source. Yeah, uh, I, I'll, let, I'll let you carry on, uh, but I guess we can take questions uh, after this 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 other part. 
Okay, um, mm. I also sent you a link, a uh, colleague of ours, uh, the created a small ah, yeah. blog post, influencers among computer scientists, he literally created a network of scientific papers, uh, who is referencing whom, and then he used PageRank to find the most influential computer scientists based on that research paper network. So maybe it can be useful. It's not a whole tutorial, but it probably has some useful uh, tips and tricks in it. Uh, okay, so... Yeah, and we just didn't reply about the direction of edges in the schema. So the uh, first question was, if we are creating a new graph, can you set rules about graph building, directed versus undirected? So Got can we... What? Do you want to take it? <laughs> I mean, uh, you can you can have... Uh, set, I, I'm not sure whether we can, uh, with the GQL Alchemy, whether we can set the rule about the uh, relationship, whether it's directed. I think that was the question, like a constraint. Um, mm, so, no. Yeah, yeah. Because Currently, uh, no. <laughs> each uh, relationship needs to have a direction. So relationships are defined with their start node and end node. So there always needs to be a direction. If you don't care about it, you're not going to use it in algorithms. There are sometimes uh, specific uh, options. You tell the algorithm, don't take the direction into account. Some don't even check the direction. It's not important to them. So there is always going to be a direction. It's up to you if you're going to use it. For example, in this query, yeah, as yeah. you can see, I tried to uh, get all of the relationships. I didn't specify the direction, but if I added this character here, it will mean that N is connected to M. Here I implied a direction. The same can be done on the other side. So now we have a directed relationship. And this means undirected. But when you create it, you have to specify it. So there needs to exist uh, a direction even yeah. if you're not going to use it later on. Uh, that's more or less the same principle in uh, every graph database because the underlying implementation relies on it. Yeah, that's it. But there is no constraint on, like on the nodes, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it me? Yeah. So what's happening under the hood? Uh, what we did uh, to achieve this uh, real-time calculations and how to tell a memgraph to work with Kafka and different stuff Ivan mentioned in this architecture. So what we created is a transformation module. So you are actually, uh, Ivan showed you how the messages are being uh, received in real time to Kafka topic. This was actually some kind of JSON, something like that. And then how memgraph reads that and how memgraph actually knows what it's going to do. So transformation module is for that. So it's actually translating messages from Kafka to Memgraph. So you are telling it, okay, on each message you receive, just give me this source username and target username and create these nodes user and match them and create the relationship between them, sorry. So that's something we already did uh, in Jupyter Notebook that Ivan showed. So this is just actually telling it for each message, do this. And parameters are telling it to take it from the uh, this dictionary that is actually created from the message. So uh, yeah, this is like a translator from Kafka to Mangraf. Uh, next, how we actually call the page rank. Uh, so. Uh, we call the online page rank. This is a dynamic page rank algorithm. We also have a just a, just normal page rank, but this is good for this use case. And here uh, we have created a trigger. What this actually means is that on each each time we set a new uh, rank to the node. So each time the rank is updated, uh, this method will be called. So call publisher update rank. What this method actually does is uh, setting up. So once the rank has been set, it is sending the message that, okay, you have this node with this ID, this user with this ID, and its rank is this. So this is being sent to the Kafka topic. And in the backend Flask server, we are reading uh, that information and sending it through the web socket on the front end. So this is that uh, computation that is happening in the background. Uh, this, in the same way, we are setting up the community detection algorithm. Uh, next, uh, what we need to do is create and start the stream. 
So this is necessary to have a, in order to have the Kafka stream. MemGraph Kafka stream is actually imported from the GQL Alchemy. And here we are creating a topic retweets. So everything that is being sent uh, to the topic, uh, this topic is called retweets. Transform is telling, uh, uh, telling Kafka which translator to use, like I said. So it's called Twitter.tweet. This is a transformation module I showed you early, earlier. And uh, next, we create a stream and we start this stream. In the end, so we also have a trigger for uh, page rank updates, community detection updates, but we also want to tell um, we also want to tell our backend and then our frontend that a new node has appeared. So a new user has done something; it's appeared in the network, and we want to show it. So we need to create another trigger that is telling on each create just uh, call publisher create and this method is again sending this information to the kafka topic and in the back end we are reading from the same topic and that's it okay so like i'm not i mean i can repeat again but yeah we created transformation module we run the algorithms we created and started the streams and then we created the trigger and module to send results back to Kafka topic. And this is actually what's happening when we are talking about that real time building applications that are have data that is coming to real time. This is the process that is going on going down under the hood. Yeah, and this was the, the result. This was some version where uh, the nodes uh, are not enlarging. I mean, this is too short gift to show it. But yeah, uh, this is uh, done using the uh, so React application, just a simple React application that uh, used WebSocket. Uh, this is Socket IO, um, yeah, Socket IO uh, library. Uh, and for the visualizations, I used uh, D3JS uh, uh, library. Um, I find it pretty useful for drawing uh, nodes uh, relationships because uh, it has nodes and links they are calling it like that so if you didn't know relationship edges and links in that tree so yeah we have lots of namings um but it's pretty easy to draw it there uh i draw the circles um so uh, then you may be interested so the radius of the circle is proportional proportional to the page rank and in d3 this is pretty simple you're just giving it like a radius to the circle and it's just enlarging it or making it smaller um, and on the right we have a community detection and as Ivan mentioned uh, it's color based on the community those nodes belong it's also another property you just give it a color and I save different kind of colors for different kind of clusters and ju then just assign the colors to these little circles this these are just uh, circles and lines uh, on SVG and that's it okay uh, and if you want to play with this data set that we showed you, uh, we created an um, instance that's available without any installations, any hassle, and so on. You can just run it in your browser. So we already imported into the Grave database, and it's running here. Then you can uh, execute a query, and it will uh, return the results in your browser. So this is a standard Cypher query and this is the results the graph that was returned so here you can see the data model it's again the same thing so a lot of users that are connected with retweeted um and this is a pretty cool way of showing other people uh what graphs are about without uh, having to go into the technical details so you can just go over the example yep. um and Thank you for your attention. I mean, this was a very long talk and a very long presentation. I hope it didn't bore you to death. Um, it's sometimes uh, an advanced uh, topic. It requires some background knowledge about graphs, about uh, math, graph theory. Then again, on the graph stream processing side, you need to have a lot of architecture knowledge, development. Um, there are a lot of services that we use in the background uh, to get stuff done. For example, Kafka is the message broker. Uh, then again, uh, the WebSocket protocol between our backend server and frontend client. It sometimes is hard to grasp, but once you create your first application, all of these uh, gray areas just go away. Everything becomes clear because um, when you do it yourself, when you do it hands-on, 
it lifts the veil. It's not magic anymore. <laughs> yeah, and uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Let's not forget. Uh, yeah, I send you the couple of links in the chat. You have them here too. So uh, yeah, if you like what we do, throw us a star. Of course, it means a lot. And also, if you are keen to open source, uh, we have different kinds of repositories that are open source. You can contribute and check out the Twitter network analysis repository. And yeah, uh, that's yeah. this demo. We have a couple of questions in the chat regarding the uh, size of the graph. Maybe I should send a scaling guide or something like that. <laughs> Uh, you can maybe read the, uh, the questions out loud. Yeah. So how big of a graph can it handle in terms of number of nodes or edges? Um, hundreds of millions. So it depends on the resources of your hardware. Because it's an in-memory graph, it relies on memory, so RAM. Uh, you can scale it up. So if you um, have a few gigabytes of RAM and you need to add more to your uh, graph, then you just need to scale the amount of RAM that's available to the graph database. Other graph databases, for example, the leading one is Neo4j, but it's a disk-based one, so it relies on hard disk or SSD storage, but on the other hand, this uh, means a degradation performance-wise, because it's disk-based, it first needs to load all the nodes and relationships in memory to perform a graph traverser or a graph algorithm, but uh, when working with MemGraph, everything is in memory all the time. Yeah, so I'm actually sending that little formula of calculating the approximate uh, storage uh, for RAM. Uh, so that because someone asked, like, um, how large a cluster should I expect to need for uh, approximately 1 million nodes and 1 million edges? Yeah, so this is actually the formula. And yeah. I mean, on my machine, uh, the largest network I imported and analyzed, I think with PageRank again, uh, it was a Cetacean network and it had around 4 million nodes and 16 million edges. And it was just shy of 10 gigabytes of RAM, I think. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. Um, I had a lot of properties as well. It depends on what you're saving on the nodes and on the relationships. I mean, there are a lot of factors. Yeah, yeah. And... Well, here he says, uh, so Thomas says that each node has just a few int uh, 32s as properties. Just a few yeah, um... So that's not a problem. I think long strings are usually problematic ones. So like short ints, uh, not that a big a problem. Yeah, probably the most... Uh... The biggest problem is when uh, these properties aren't used the way they are intended to. Uh, some uh, users uh, tried to store uh, images in the form of uh, byte strings to the properties and the graph, of course, got out of hand because that was uh, quite a lot of data. Um, there are some other ways to handle it. For example, the GQL Alchemy library has an on-disk storage uh, functionality. So what that means is you define the class like we did in the Jupyter notebook. Let me show you. So we say um, username yeah, yeah. is a string and it's going to be saved to the database. But then you can also create, for example, a file where you're going to save PDF files or images and so on. Um, let's say any um do you maybe know the syntax uh from the yeah head so uh, field um uh, and then on disk on i think underscore disk uh equals true so what this actually does it seamlessly saves uh saves this property to the um uh, uh to some kind of sql database so, yeah. um jql alchemy comes with a sqlite 3 yeah sqlite so a very yeah. lightweight relational database uh, that's included in Python, I think. And this is great, yeah, because you can run the algorithms on just these properties that you are going to save to the database. And once it's returned, you are connecting it to the other properties of this uh, class. Yeah. Because graph analytics are all about getting uh, insights from your data, about analyzing it, running graph algorithms. It doesn't make a lot of sense to store large objects in memory, it's going to slow down these algorithms. And we are working with very large networks with millions of nodes and millions of edges. 
each byte of memory counts. So what we do is we save this data that doesn't have to be analyzed right away on disk so we can maybe use it later on. Yeah. If anyone has any yeah, questions, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So just a, just a few comments for our audience. So, uh, Ivan and Katerune here today shared some links. These links will be available on the Big Number website, so you'd have the video, uh, the slides, and the links that uh, were shared here today. I have a question, if 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 I may. Of course. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of similarities here with uh, with respect to Redis. Uh, so Redis now, I, now of course, the first thing that comes to mind is Redis has more, uh, for lack of better words, more primitive data structures. So you have sets, you have lists, you have dictionaries. Whereas here, you, here you have you have graphs. And the idea is the same: you read what, much of what you can to memory, and let's say uh, delegate the rest of the data to permanent storage. So RAM here is your, your memory here referred to temporary storage and the rest of the data goes into permanent storage. So I believe you have a similar uh, mechanism here. Yeah. So where, for our, for our audience, where would MemGraph be a better alternative to something like Redis? Um, when you're working with highly connected data. As Katarina mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, graph analytics work on networks, on graphs, when you have a lot of relationships. So for example, when you have a log of information, you're logging uh, what your application does. And these are a lot of rows of statistical data that's not connected to each other. That's not a good use case for graph databases. Like you shouldn't use them, go steer away from it. But then if you have a network, for example, the citation networks of books that are connected to each other, of people that are connected to each other, of processes that rely on each other, then you can harness the power of graph analytics and not even complex graph algorithms. It's much easier to read the data. It's faster to uh, read it because the relationships are stored on the object. So if I have a user, Ivan, and it's connected to the user, Katarina, when I fetch the object, Ivan, the relationship is already on it. So I can go directly to Katarina. Whereas when you use the relational model, you need to have one table, then you need to create a connection, how you're going to connect this table to another one, and then you can get the information out of it. So it's not directly there. You need to have a lot of uh, steps in between. So I hope this kind of clarified it a bit. Yes, thank you. And I see we have a question from Ron. Yeah, yes, Ron just Ron. joined our Discord. Thanks, Ron, for joining us. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. I just wanted to say this is a great presentation. It is so nice to be able to uh, uh, have a session like this and, and be able to speak with people. I mean, there's there's so much stuff going on in the net these days where yeah. they're just recordings. I'm like, screw that. I want to, I would like to be able to talk to people. And so uh, I hope as you go forward, you'll, you'll remember that that's really important to a lot of people. Um, my question about uh, directed acyclic graphs was more of a, I, I think the term might be have different meanings in mathematics and inside of memgraph, uh, a classical, strict a DAG only has one route uh, from the root to any given node so that and it's it's intended to prevent circular dependencies so that so that's that was what my uh, question was related to is there a way if you're starting a brand new graph you're not you're not importing it from someplace or mm -hmm. whatever whether you can tell the uh, that instance of the gra of the graph that I don't want circular dependencies. I mean, uh, there's lots of applications where that works. Uh, I actually did something like that a long time ago for AT&T Bell Labs related to the, uh, the, build, the file, the make files used to build the 5ESS telephony switch. We had thousands of make files. We had make files that were 10,000 lines and we had to come up with ways to visualize that system and uh, so we wound up using uh, uh, actually some a DAG type of thing. It was actually a library in something called S, which is the 
forerunner of R. Why it went, why the letter went backwards, I don't know. But um, so I, I see this as being a really a great tool to use if if you can also include some of those restraints at some point. Okay, so one way to go would be to create a custom uh, constraint. So this was this will be something that a core engineering team will have to do on the graph database itself. For example, this directed acyclic constraint. But another way uh, could be to create a trigger. So for example, whenever a new relationship is created in the graph, run this algorithm that's going to check if the graph is still a directed uh, acyclic graph. So each, but um, it depends on how often relationships and nodes are added to the graph if you're talking about a streaming use case. So if it happens every few nanoseconds, it's gonna be probably bad because it needs some D time. Difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's a computationally yeah. expensive. It's a competition. Yeah. But you can also create uh, this uh, DAG check uh, that's going to execute every few, I don't know, seconds, minutes, uh, whatever the time frame needs to be. But if the um, creations are happening um, in a reasonable uh, time frame, then a trigger could be the best option. Yeah. Great. Uh, it's, it's good to know. I'll let somebody else talk. I did. I <laughs> did have another comment about your 3D or your uh, graphic visualization. So went the way. Yeah, you can. You can just say yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I just love how uh, you, I think uh, that somebody mentioned that physics was turned on and I can see there's almost a gravitational mass effect yeah. going on here. And as, as a side effect of that, you see objects in orbit. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, you can have. I mean, uh, I had a lot of trouble of figuring this out. Not sure if anyone here work with D three JS. So it has lots of forces which you can define. So like a charge force, gravitational force. Uh, I mean, uh, lots of different kind of forces, and you are actually defining how the nodes are going to attract each other. So uh, if I wanted that this largest node would be in the middle, you can define everything circular. I mean, it's interesting, but it's a really lots of playing with the code and okay what will this look like <laughs> so it has forces and it's not that easy i would say i mean in my opinion <laughs> yeah and uh i think i dropped in the chat that i i've worked with something called p5 uh, js p5 is the javascript version of the processing framework mm -hmm. and they have all sorts of libraries like this you can you can model particles uh uh, I, I've seen presentations of P5 where they they model flocks of birds, like how do birds fly, nice. you know, when they're in huge flocks and stuff. So, okay. uh, I just I just have to add, Katerina, this is a beautiful visualization. You should be very proud of it. Uh, and, thank you. And very I, much. I, I I love being able to see this stuff. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you. Fun fact, no, really, thank you for the praise. I think this was literally the second time Katarina was doing anything with these three js like visual, um, creating this the second like time she React created the React and, application. Yeah, this I'm a beginner. I'm a total beginner. I'm just figuring it out. But I googled P5. I'm going to check it out. Thank you, Ron. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, thanks again. And I will add to this, by the way, it's, it's not just the visualization. I completely agree with Ron. Just the way this presentation was structured from the uh, introduction to what a graph is all the way to the coding uh, example, the, 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 the visualization of it in the, uh, in the dashboard. And even you move on to the, the, the graph, the, the streaming architecture, by the way, the streaming ar architecture. So I'm taking notes. <laughs> yeah, but but this was this was truly this was truly engaging. And like I said, I I I I'm gonna get started with your platform because I have a I have an actual need for this precisely. So it's like uh, I don't know what you call it, but it's like uh, the stars were aligned. For <laughs> we helped others. someone. We are really glad, yeah. <laughs> and thank you very much for your comments. I mean, it's really nice to hear this because when you are um, when you are working on this kind of presentation, you are always thinking, okay, how will people will people get this? Is this is right? We were changing the slide, like uh, the order of the slides. What is better? 
like when you are when someone is first time seeing graphs or something like that so it's really good feedback so thank you very much <laughs> And, uh, Anyone and just have on, any other... oh, I, yes. I have a comment about Ron's comment. I can't wait for in-person events to get back. Like these meetups are great when we can communicate with each other and speak, but nothing beats the yeah. in-person experience. Yeah. And definitely better than recordings. Oh yes, of course, sure. I mean, I, I'm planning on Ron. I'm calling you from Dubai. Uh, Ron, Ron, are you? Uh, are, are you in the are you in new york chicago i'm in the chicago area and in uh chicago area. yeah uh, katarina uh, and this ivan yourselves zagreb croatia but yeah, we'll zagreb. Be traveling a lot this year okay, yeah so a lot. This, we have we have we have ourselves an international uh, international uh, call uh yes by the way this uh above in this this uh work this event is recorded like i said it will be put on youtube and and our uh uh, a website. So on the website, you you will actually find the slides and the links that Katerina and Ivan shared here. Yeah, I, I hope you know. Uh, um, right now, Big Number has seventeen meetups, one for different cities, mainly in Western Europe and uh, North America. But I'm I'm looking forward to actually having these meetings in person. In the meantime, you know, we can just uh, appreciate, <laughs> or we just have to enjoy the the. Uh, you know, the, the, the luxury of the internet. Anyway, I'm gonna stop talking. If anyone has any questions for Ivan and Katerina, please, please go ahead. Yeah, but this was a pretty good response. I mean, you have a really good group. I, I can say that this, this is my feedback because we were presenting on a couple of meetups and um, people are usually shy and I get that. That's what we talk about. It's not an in-person event, so yeah but here this is a really good uh, group of people yeah so nice thank you all for joining us yeah i can't believe it we had actual conversations <laughs> yeah yeah and really good questions i mean i see that lots of people are really interested into uh, this technology and know about this and also i like the part with mathematics i'm going to check out your uh, uh, your april meetup you told us about yeah, I, I look forward to it. I'm lucky, actually. I'm lucky to have uh, such amazing uh, committed members like Ron uh, and, and many others. Now, v, she was here earlier today, but I guess you know she's also in Dubai, so she had to she, she had to uh, uh, leave early on. But yes, uh, I'm I, I'm really grateful that you guys uh, chose our meetup for running your presentation. I hope maybe we can do this uh, some other time. Uh, because sure. I, I really enjoy this, I, I think our participants share the sentiment. Uh, where would where if we want to get started? Which should we go mainly to the website? Um, the documentation. I would right? say documentation. You know, always website Definitely. is always flashy, uh, like all <laughs> websites. <laughs> it's pretty, but the documentation is like the core of it and we are working uh, so our colleagues i think kruno is here if he hasn't left our colleague kruno was here yeah he's here so he is writing our documentation he's our technical writer and he does a really good job of making this really good and we are working really hard on that so i think documentation is a really good yeah tutorials like ivan is showing you uh you can go through whole tutorials also our our blog section i can send you the link if you like but yeah Blog I think it's and good documentation. Documentation, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm down to my last minute here. So uh, I, I put a link to some work I did in P5.js oh. in there. And this is using the, uh, the 3D version of the canvas, which uses WebGL. And uh, I apologize for the code not having a lot of documentation, but hopefully you'll be, you have, when you, if you click on that link in the upper left, you have to click on the, there's a, a red button. thing, a run button, and then okay. the thing, the, the thing will render itself on the right side. And there's some sliders and one little button you can play with. But the, and nice. you can, you can drag the uh, object <laughs> around and it'll rotate in 3D space. So this is pretty uh, cool. The depth of it, uh, I like it. Yeah, and uh, if you if you look at it, what this was is a, a visualization of the RGB color model. And uh, it gives you a way to look at what's inside of a solid cube. 
So uh, it's interesting stuff. But nice. uh, Danny, it was good. Danny, it was good to see you again. I lost track of you. I, I missed your last st statistics session. So um, now I'm on. I joined your Slack channel, so I hope that fixed that. But you might want to consider moving to a Discord. I'm becoming a big fan of it, and it, <laughs> it's just for me, it's just better. So I think you were the first person or the second person to suggest Discord. I think I think I'm gonna make the move. I well, think you, uh, you, yeah, you should. <laughs> And, and one thing I'll tell you is because, you know, they don't constantly harass me to download their app. I, I don't have room for the oh. whole world's apps. Okay. I got a web, I, I, I have a, I have a web browser. That's all I should need. Right. So yeah, I think the, we never send that kind of link. <laughs> yeah, no, but oh, no, when you, when you, when you, when you first log into discord, they'll tell you there is an app, but they don't harass you constantly to get it. Whereas Slack has just become used All to be night. better but it's slack is becoming the uh, but thanks again to this group i gotta go this was so much fun and i i gained so much information i really thank appreciate you. it thank you and on that note let me also thank you ron everybody here attending today big thank you to you uh, ivan katarina i really really enjoyed this it's very difficult to make technical <laughs> workshops entertaining but you guys you know, you absolutely uh, nailed it. So I'm going to be an advocate for a mem graph because I, 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 I actually have a need for it. I'm not just giving you praise. Uh, and it's, uh, I've, I've uh, encountered a lot of challenges get, just getting up in a simple, simple database up and running for a small application. But what you showed here uh, makes it straightforward. So Definitely everybody do, ch do check out mem graph. Keep up the good stuff. Um, and I hope maybe, you know, we, 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 can, we can be in touch again, but until next time, everybody, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you in the next big number workshop. Thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.